Blog Talk Radio. Me chia mo apura kanu apurai kai nut ene ye akanfo nana song da me dinde ujirapo kwesi rane mpata akan akwamu mine amaruka etivi mu ujirapo ujiramine mu. Greetings to all apura kani apurai kai nut people meaning Africans black people today is akanfo nana song day. Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Legend Day. My name is Ojirapo Kwesi Radne Mpata Akan. Ojirapo of the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojirama. The purified nation, Apurakani, Apuraitaitni people in the Western Hemisphere. Did I say we thank you once again for tuning into the broadcast. Um, we are opening up the chat room and so forth. Now, if you have any questions or comments, and you like to interact in the chat room, you must log in as a user in order to interact. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, simply hit the number one so that we can see that your hand is raised and we can interact in that fashion. For those who are new to the broadcast, we have four broadcasts on a weekly basis. We have Akan Fo Narason, Ancient Authentic Akan Ancestry Religion on Joda on Monday nights, where we deal specifically with the Akan expression of Narason Ancestry Religion. First and foremost, because we are Akan. Secondly, because of the misinformation being propagated regarding Akan and such religion, culture, cosmology, ritual practice, and so forth, not only from individuals in the Western Hemisphere, but also from individuals on the continent of Afuraka, Afuraka, who have been infected with white cultures, pseudo-religions such as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Hebrewism, all of that nonsense, Buddhism, and so forth, and therefore these infections infect their presentation of ancestry religion. So we deal with ancient, authentic, Akan ancestry religion, dealing with our ancestral origins from ancient Kana, which is the Khan land, the first land, the foremost land, the land of the beginning, the title of ancient Nubia, where our people originated from a couple of thousand years ago after the fall of ancient Kanit and Kemet, so-called Egypt and Nubia and so forth, some of our people migrated from the Kanit land or Kanat, the Nubian Empire, migrated west and reestablished ourselves in the western part of the continent and reestablished the Kanat Empire or the Ganat Empire, the Nubian Empire, and so forth, and continued civilization. A thousand years later, because of Muslim invasions, some of our people migrated further south and reestablished themselves in the forest belt and savannah regions of um, West Afuraka, Afuraikai reestablished Akana civilization in the forest belt hundreds of years subsequent to that. Some of our people were forced into North, Central, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe during the Musuo Kessie, the Great Perversity, the Enslavement Era. And this is how some of our people ended up in the Western Hemisphere. However, we maintained our ancestral religious practices the Akan ancestry religion in Suriname in South America is called Wingti, from the Akan term Huinti. Akan ancestry religion is called Obia in Jamaica from the Akan term Obai. Akan ancestry religion is called Hudu in North America from the Akan term Undu, meaning medicine from roots, trees, plant life. It also means to become heavy with the spirit through spirit possession, spirit communication. And we find these same terms in the language of ancient Kanit and Kemet. Thus, in the Medutu, the hieroglyphs, you will find that the term Undu means medicine from roots, trees, plant life. Undu also means to become heavy, heavy with the spirit and so forth. It also means the offerings that are given to the deities on the shrines and so forth. And the altar itself is also called the Undu, a title of ancient Nubia. It's the Undu land and the people called the Undu people. But we make that direct ancestral connection from ancient Kana, so-called Nubia, to West Afuraka, Afuraka, to Hudu in North America, Akan ancestry religion spanning thousands of years and two continents. So that's what we deal with on our Kanfo Nanasom. On Benada, Abinada, Tuesday nights, we have Ojida, which means purification. We deal with ancestral religion in general, not just the Akan expression, but ancestral religion in general and how it impacts every aspect of our lives. 
Afurakani, Afurakani, the African ancestral religion, no matter what form it takes on the continent of Afuraka, Afurakai, as well as in the Western Hemisphere, in the forms of Hoodoo, which is Akan, or Juju, which is Yoruba, Voodoo, which is Ebon, Grigri, Bambara, Gola, and Kisi, Gela and Gichi traditions, and various other traditions. Ancestry religion is defined in essence as the ritual incorporation of divine law and the ritual restoration of divine balance. That means through ritual we incorporate those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to incorporate in order to harmonize our thoughts, intentions, and actions with divine order. And through ritual we reject those things, objects, deeds, and entities we need to reject in order to restore balance to our thoughts, intentions, and actions, and thus realign ourselves with divine order. So the ritual incorporation of divine law, the ritual restoration of divine balance, these are the expansive and contractive poles of ancestral religion. We state that Ojida purification operationalizes Nanason. Purification operationalizes our practice of ritually incorporating divine law and ritually restoring divine balance so that we can execute our function in the world, live in harmony with our culture, which is executing our divine function in the world without creating disorder in the process. When we make legitimate mistakes, Throughout the course of our lives, then we engage the ritual process to incorporate law and restore balance so that we can align every thought, every intention, and every action with divine order every moment of every day. This is our ancestral culture or way of life as Afurakani, Afurakani people, the divine acceptance, the law, the love of divine order, and the divine rejection, the divine hate of disorder and its purveyors. So this is how ancestral religion through purification impacts every aspect of our lives as we seek to align every thought, every intention, and every action, every moment of every day with divine order, and the ritual process allows us to stay in alignment in that capacity. So we deal with the purification of concepts, purification of cosmology, purification of the knowledge of the culture that we've inherited through our spirit genetic blood circles and transmitted intergenerationally and transcarnationally through successive incarnations here in the Western Hemisphere. Thus, we were empowered and guided by the Abosom and Nananom Nsamampo and spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our direct blood circles, empowered and guided by them here in the Western Hemisphere on the best means by which to wage war against the whites and their offspring through taking up metal armaments, as well as utilizing chemical and biological warfare, root work being the precedent established for chemical and biological warfare in the Western Hemisphere. We were empowered and guided by the deities and ancestral spirits to wage war against the whites and their offspring, incessantly enforce the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere, and engage that nation-building process, that Amanie process. That's what we deal with on Benada, Abenada, Tuesday nights. On our Wukuda, Akuda, Wednesday nights, we have Egwa Marketplace, where we showcase Afurakani, Afurakani businesses, organizations, and institutions, those who are serving the Afurakani, Afurakani community in a positive capacity, those who are maintaining their ancestral religious values in the context of that service. So we showcase those businesses, organizations, and institutions. You will find many of those businesses, organizations, and institutions, in fact, all of them, in our books. For example, the Etchi Sign Ancestral Religious Reversion Conference Journals, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, as well as the Hudu Mind, Hudu Nation Journals, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, as well as the Ojira Mind, Afashe, the Purified Nation Conference Journals, Volumes 1 and 2, and also Volume 3, which is coming up. We place those businesses, organizations, and institutions in those journals. They're part of our, when we have our conferences on a regular basis, we have our Egua Marketplace section and those vendors and other businesses, organizations, and institutions in our community are showcased there. But we have our Ocom Economic Development Model, which we have published. You can download for free. It is an approach to economic development rooted in our ancestral religious values. It is thus a holistic approach to economic development governed by our ancestral religious practices, a valued approach, Part of that process is the operation we call Starve the Beast and Feed the Pride. That means you make an assessment on a weekly basis 
to determine what funds you would have potentially wasted with the whites and their offspring, and then we starve the beast and feed the pride. We redirect those funds away from the white businesses and direct them to the business organization or institution of the week. We showcase one Afurakani Afurakani business organization or institution per week. Thus, when you transfer $10 away from a white business, starve that white beast and feed the pride and transfer those funds to a black business, that's a transfer of $10 in capital. When a thousand of our people who are supporting that starve the beast and feed the pride operation engage the same process, that's a $10,000 transfer from white businesses to a single black business in the course of seven days that allows that black business to expand their products and services to us greatly, it allows them to hire within the community within the course of seven days permanently and full-time. It's a win-win situation. They serve us at a greater capacity, expand their product lines and services to us, hire within the community, and so forth. If we do not engage that process, then by default, we leave that $10,000 and ultimately $20 billion weekly 95 plus percent of that in the hands of the whites and their offspring. We are therefore financing our own oppression, leaving these funds in the hands of our absolute enemies, the whites and their offspring. That means white Europeans, white Asians, white Americans, white Hindus, white Hispanics, white Arabs, white pseudo Native Americans who are invading Asians, white Latinos, white Latinas, and so forth. The whites and their offspring are enemies spirits of disorder incarnate, we are leaving billions of dollars in the hands of our absolute enemies on a weekly basis, spending over $20 billion plus dollars on a weekly basis, 95 plus percent of that going directly to our enemies, the whites and their offspring, financing our own oppression, supporting them, and starving our own people. We need to reverse that process and ship billions of dollars away from white businesses to the 2 million black businesses that already exist and also allowing black businesses to grow and develop and be founded and so forth when we ship billions of dollars weekly from white businesses to our own. And all we have to do is simply make a decision to starve the beast and feed the problem. On Yauda Thursday, which is also Yada and Abada Thursday night, we have Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation. On that broadcast, we deal with issues that are confronting us as Afurakani, Afurakani people, as an Oman, as a nation, specifically as Ojirama, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people in the Western Hemisphere. We have an Amaniye approach, a nationist approach. When we deal with Amaniye or nationism, we're talking about the purification of nationalism. It is an approach to Amain Sesu, a nation building, restoration from a purified perspective, a grounded perspective, a holistic perspective, an ancestral religious values-based perspective. We have a proper understanding through ancestral religion, the only proper understanding of what a nation actually is. An Oman or a nation is a living, breathing entity governed by specific forces in creation, just like your organs and glands are an entity, entities, governed by specific forces in creation that they have children, which are the cells that interface with one another harmoniously, but they also serve the collective whole, serve the parent organ of which they are a component part. And when we have been drawn into the Western Hemisphere, forced to migrate, but at some point our ancestresses and ancestors direct us to coalesce in a specific region of the Earth Mother in the West, in this region of her body, the coalesce in a specific region, blend ancestral blood circles in this region, interface with the unique expression of the deities, the abosom, the orisha, the vodou, as they manifest in this region, interface with the plant life, animal life, mineral life, for food as well as medicine, as well as their spirit totems as they manifest in this region, interface with the unique expression of the earth and mother divinities in this region of their body in the West, that coalescing and confluence of events allows us to forge a locative identity, an expression of Afurakani, Afurakani culture, and ancestral religious practice, and nation building rooted in our experience here in the Western region of the Earth Mother's body. Therefore, we have a unique expression of our culture, ancestral religious practice, and our approach to solving our issues 
We deal with Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism, understanding that an Omain, a nation, is a living, breathing entity governed by specific forces in creation, Abosom, Vodou, and so forth. So that's what we deal with on the Amain Sim Affairs of the Nation broadcast. Those are our, our four broadcasts that we deal with. Um, tonight is a special broadcast of Akanfo Nanasom, ancient, authentic Akan ancestry religion. Give me one second right quick. I need to check the some of the information here. Hold on one second. But it's a special broadcast of our Kanfo Nanasom where we have we normally deal with specifically ancient authentic Akan ancestry religion. But we're going to be talking about our upcoming one one of the things we'll be talking about is our upcoming event. We have an event scheduled coming up. Uh, Memorial Day weekend in Treme, in New Orleans. That is uh, May 26th, May 27th, that particular weekend. That event is called Ka, Kaet, Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo. That is the training, cultural, and ritual retreat. And that is coming up on Memorial Day weekend. Now, we did a retreat in South Carolina on Edisto Island um, in February. That's a training cultural and ritual retreat and for a specific group and so forth. Um, and there's information on the website about that. But the Ka Kayat retreat, when you go to the website, Ka Kayat, the soul of hoodoo and voodoo, myself and voodoo queen Kalinda Laveau will be conducting the sessions there. The focus is yes, it is the soul of hoodoo and voodoo, but Obedima and Obata, Afuraikani manhood and Afuraikani womanhood, training, cultural, and ritual retreat. Establishing Afuraikani manhood and Afuraikani womanhood, African black manhood, African black womanhood, rooted in our ancestral religious values. That is the cornerstone for strong relationships. Strong relationships are the cornerstone for marriage. Strong marriages are the cornerstone for strong families and child rearing and so forth. Strong families and child rearing are the cornerstone for Amain Sesu nation building, restoration, which of course is the cornerstone for Amaniye nationism, the purification of nationalism. So we're dealing with Apuraikani manhood, Apuraikani womanhood, rooted in our ancestral religious values, rooted in our Hudu and Voodoo traditions and so forth. So we will be conducting, I'll be conducting the Obedima Afrakani Manhood workshop training, which is based on the book, Obedima, our book, Obedima Afrakani Manhood. Kalinda will be conducting the Obadatai Afrakani Women training workshop with the sisters, which is based on the book, our book, Obadatai Afrakani Womanhood. We will also have our joint session on Pata Sasatim, which is our educational curriculum for Afrakani Afrakani a youth as well as adults. We will also have a joint session dealing with Afuraikani manhood and Afuraikani womanhood in the context of ancestral religion. We will also be dealing with, we will also have vegan food and so forth throughout that weekend. We'll also, Kalinda does um, retreats in, well, well uh, tours in Louisiana, in New Orleans, but cultural tours specifically dealing with true ancestral religious practice, the true story of New Orleans based on that Vodou perspective or true grounded perspective. She'll be conducting those tours as, that tour as well for us. We will also be going to do, deal with um, ancestral ritual and so forth at Congo Square. So a number of things will, will be happening when you see our website, the Ka Kayet page on our, web, on our website, and we'll post the link in the chat room. You can get all of the details. We are only set out to register 25 people uh, for the event. We have a few spaces left, so if you would like to attend that event, uh, simply go to the page. You can register right there on the page. We do have a discount for married couples, 50% off of the uh, discounted, 50% off of the uh, registration. So we wanted to bring our guest, Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau, on. Um, we've been collaborating for a couple of years now. 
we went out to I went out to New Orleans. We did a joint presentation. It was a great event and so forth. And we're just going to get into it right now. So give me one second. Okay, Michelle, well, on the phone line, Galinda, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? What's up? How are you doing? Pretty good. How are you doing? I'm good. So first, and the chat room is open now. If you have any questions or comments, um, you must log in as a user in order to interact in the chat room. And if you have any questions or comments on the phone line, um, hit the number one so that we can see that your hands are raised. So first and foremost, I just want to say, may I say, thank you for, you know, joining us, finally getting a chance <laughs> to connect with you <laughs> on the broadcast. <laughs> so no, we, we really appreciate it. It's, it's an honor for you to be on the broadcast to bring some light to our little show. So, um, <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, no, we, we really appreciate it. So we want to get into some information, some basic information. Um, there are a lot of things. People hear about voodoo in New Orleans. It, it becomes popular. People are watching, you know, shows like, you know, Treme on television or uh, when, you know, uh, Marie Laveau is depicted by Angela Bassett and, and other people. People hear a lot mm-hmm. of different things. People hear about stories and their families dealing with voodoo and so forth. But there are a number of things about the tradition that many people do not understand. I know when I visited New Orleans and when we connected in New Orleans a couple of years ago, that was the first time of me visiting New Orleans itself. I've been to Louisiana before, but I hadn't been to uh, New Orleans. So it's a different, you know, culture, and we want to get into that. We want to get into that whole Louisiana Purchase thing. But when you go there and you see all of this uh, tourist voodoo and so forth and you read things online about, you know, these Achiwadiefo spirits of disorder, the whites and their offspring, these crackers talking about there was no, you know, voodoo in New Orleans until the Haitians came and, anybody talking about voodoo in New Orleans outside of Haitian voodoo is really just making something up that is pure mm-hmm. nonsense. And once we connected and we were already on the same page the very first time we had a conversation and you shared a lot about the ancestral voodoo tradition that I was totally unaware of, the way it's been maintained in the blood circles. So let's just start off talking about that. What is um, the climate for this tourist voodoo in New Orleans, and what's the difference between that and the ancestrally inherited voodoo that that you've inherited and you practice in your family? Okay, so first I want to say it has been the culture to keep voodoo very secret. There's been times in history where we were not allowed to practice So that could be a matter of life or death. And then even after it wasn't a matter of life or death, there was always a stigma attached to practicing voodoo. So a lot of people keep it secret, and they have kept it secret over the years because there's a lot of ignorance surrounding it. There's a lot of ideas. So, for instance, I used to do hair. And I had half of my clients were spiritual clients, the other half were hair clients. And I didn't necessarily tell my hair clients that I practiced voodoo initially because you would get that stigma, oh, she's going to try to take my hair, she's going to try to do something, because there's a lot of ignorance around the idea of practicing voodoo. So voodoo basically went underground in Louisiana, and it was practiced and maintained within families. So you may go to, you know, other places, you know, some places in Latin America, places in the Caribbean, and you'll see a little bit more of an open practice. Um, I know it even in Haitian voodoo, you know, you'll see entire communities practicing. Well, in New Orleans or in Louisiana in general, uh, that was mostly within the family. And so you get a lot of variation because it was maintained in the family and in secret. And then because there was nobody to really speak on it, that left a lot of room for others to come in and fill in the story. 
And so they would fill in the story with what they felt was interesting, what would sell. And there was a lot of room for exploitation because you had nobody really speaking up on what voodoo was or what it is. So lots of people wrote uh, articles in newspapers historically. Uh, Later on, people began to write books. They would write books of what they think they saw. And most of the time, no, it wasn't really a situation of, of the people who were writing these uh, books or publications. They were not witnessing a real voodoo ritual. Most of the time, they were, rich, they were witnessing a social gathering. So, for instance, a lot of times they'll talk about uh, what they saw in Congo Square. You saw a social gathering in Congo Square. So anytime they saw us dancing and saw us playing drums, we can do we can use those same tools for multiple things. So sometimes we're contacting the spirit, sometimes it's a social uh, get together, social dance. So most of the time they were talking about what they think they saw, and so then they would all compare stories and they would come up with this concept. And of course they had to make it negative. Oh, they're killing babies or they're sacrificing, you know, uh, children or whatever it was that they would make up. And this became interesting, an interesting concept when people begin to write books or horror books, uh, definitely for movies. And if you have, to start off with, if you have a people that you mean to enslave, you don't want them tapped into their power. So voodoo, just like all of the African traditions, uh, it's, first of all, it gets us in touch with who we really are. It gets you in touch with the soul's purpose. It gets you in touch with your lineage, you know, your DNA, your ancestors. And it's a source of power that was not understood. And so we were able to communicate in a way that, the slave master didn't understand, and they understood it was powerful because when we did this, things happened, things moved. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to shut down that tradition, and that's a very old concept. Um, That's a a normal method of conquering the people to take their gods and turn them into, you know, the new devil and then give them your gods. And so basically that's what was done. And so now still today, you have lots of black people just at the mention of the word voodoo, their eyes might get big or they might uh, feel a sense of fear just at the word voodoo. And then you have some who will say, oh, it doesn't even exist, or they've been watching movies and they say, oh, it's not going to work on me because I don't believe in it. And it's not really about something working on you or not working on you. It's an entire science that most people don't understand and they just kind of limit it down to somebody cursing or hexing somebody. Uh, so with the tour industry, uh, and just I'm not going to say just, just, just the entire uh, lore of coming to New Orleans, they give you this voodoo, it's mysterious, or this idea of voodoo is mysterious. It's uh, a little bit dangerous. Um You know, they make, uh, this is to lure people in to think that they're having some type of a haunted experience. And so that's become being taken seriously even outside of the the tourist industry. So it's meant to glamour people, but that's being taken seriously. And that's become the representation of voodoo in Louisiana all over the world because for a very long time, you didn't really have anyone speaking up for that. Um, I think that for, you know, quite a while, you can can look back to the 60s and 70s, you would have people coming from, you know, uh, Cuba speaking about their traditions, and then later on, you would have people coming from Haiti speaking about their traditions. You could see this happening on u- in university settings, but not so much about voodoo in Louisiana. Um so this is a time where we definitely want to come and put the real information out. Absolutely. No, we appreciate that 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 breakdown, that background. So, and when we're talking about uh, New Orleans, the very often people focused on you know focus on the city, 
Um, mm-hmm. But you also talked about it in the video that you did, the two-part series that you did, and it's online. People can see that, and we incorporated some of that into, you know, the trailer for the um, event coming up. But you talk about the rural areas, like Opelousas and other places, and how the traditions right. were maintained in the rural areas. And but even before that, let's talk about this this notion that many people won't know unless they travel that the Louisiana Purchase really changes the whole scope. Because as you were talking about in the video, before, you know, what, uh, 1803 or when, that, when around that time when it happened, Louisiana was still, you know, controlled by the French, and it made up that Louisiana territory, rather, made up about one-third of the entire United States. So it's really yeah. like a totally different country and people, you know, and of course, you know, United States purchased from France and so forth, but it was still a kind of a different country, a different territory. So there's a difference between when you leave the Louisiana territory and move into the territory governed by the British, even there's a kind of a cultural, you know, shock. And unless people go back yeah. and forth, they won't know the difference. Um, but prior to that Haitian migration, and prior to the, you know, the shift in Louisiana Purchase and all of that, you talked about how voodoo was maintained in the rural areas and just in the blood circles. So how was it maintained in your family culture? Just talk a little bit about how it was maintained, the way certain things were done in your family. Okay. Uh, first, I just want to say the notion um, – when people speak about the notion of there was nothing here and later the Haitians came and, and brought voodoo that there was nothing here before or, um, you know, just the fact that, that, that there's nothing remaining here, uh, that's absurd. Um, you had the same intelligent and cultivated Africans coming to Louisiana that you had coming to other parts of the so-called New World. So you had uh, enslaved Africans who were Congo, who were Eve, you know, who were Bambara, who were Akan, and they brought their traditions here with them. And so New Orleans is a port city. So what happened, it was first uh, ruled by the French and then later by the Spanish. And so the French and the Spanish were both a little bit more liberal when you compared them to the Americans. So, number one, there were certain rights. Now, slavery is slavery, but there were certain rights that enslaved Africans had that they did not have when the Americans came in. There was also certain rights that uh, free people of color had, Creole Jean de Tula Libra had, that they did not have when the Americans came in. And so it was a little bit more liberal at that point. So to, to go in Congo Square on Sundays, to have that, that time on Sundays to be able to go in Congo Square and sell your, your goods and uh, to congregate, that was allowed under the French. Even a certain amount of uh, freedom of expression, you know, drumming, dancing, that was allowed under the French. When the Americans came in, they wiped all of that out. So they was like, okay, all of y'all are black. I don't care if you used to be free. I don't care if you were enslaved. All of y'all are black. So nobody has any rights anymore. And so what happened was a lot of people who were free, especially, they went out to the rural part. And that's not all of all of the people who were free, but a lot of them did because you could basically – you could control your fortune through land at that point. So if you had land, everything was pretty much isolated. You, you sort of had a freedom, so to speak, because you had land. You could provide a certain life for your family. So in those rural areas, you have some of those old attractions because with New Orleans being a poor city, you constantly had people coming in and out. And so you had Cubans coming in and out, you had Haitians coming in and out, and and, and many other people. Uh, Certainly, a lot of those traditions would begin to influence. 
Uh, and that's not just with the spirituality. That's also with uh, music. That's also with dance. But in the rural part, it's kind of like the same thing that happens when you get somebody who moves from another country into the United States. Maybe they, they their family might have moved in the 60s, and you look at people today, and it's, you know, the 2000s, and they're still kind of uh, maintaining like an old school culture that is true to what that country was in the 60s. So that's kind of how it was with uh, voodoo in the rural part. So that was maintained within the family, you know, uh, styles of uh, dancing, music, um, food, things like that. That was maintained in the country. And so basically you would learn from the people in your family. Uh, It was heavily passed through women, but it's not only the case that there was – there was also men, and we call we have a tradition that we call treasures with a treat. And a lot of people that did practice voodoo and hoodoo were also known as treaters, and this was a form of spirit medicine. And so you have a lot of people that still practice that in the country even today. And so basically, you just it's it's not um, it's not something that's so uncommon or so. I'm not going to say it's not special. Um, this is this is the case among quite a few families. I guess I'm trying to say it's not it's not something that's so unique or so odd. It was this was commonplace. So this was taught to me by my family. And as I got older, I didn't know that this was necessarily what I would be doing pretty much full time, but that's just the way it happened, you know. Exactly. And and so you're and you're you have family that were from the rural area. So um in fact what are some of the rural areas that people typically don't hear about? People always hear about, you know, New Orleans, they hear about the city and everything, but what are some of those rural areas that you're talking about? Um, so there's uh, Opelousas, Lafayette, New Iberia. Um, there's also Shreveport, Monroe, that's in northern Louisiana. Um, there's Lake Charles. Um, there's a place, or uh, used to be a place called Mossville. There's there's so many little cities, and or I shouldn't say cities. There's so many little towns in Louisiana. Um, I don't even know all the names, but um, okay. there are lots of places, uh, rural places, uh, Washington, Louisiana, that's one of them. Uh, Morgan City, there's, there's lots of them. Um, but the culture is pretty much the same. The, the, the more you get into the country, the more you'll still find people that speak uh, fluent Creole. You know, you find people who still did things the old ways. Now, they're, you know, pretty much in their 70s and 80s right now, um, but you still, you still have them. Now, and it sounds like it's 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 akin to even and I said British before, but I, I, that talking about the American purchase. I said British, but the American purchase of you know the Louisiana territory. But it sounds similar in that aspect of some of our people being brought to North America, some import cities and so forth, but then some being taken to you know Mississippi, Alabama. Some of our people remain there. But then some of our people, you know, migrated north and went into the northern cities, the industrial cities, and so forth. Some people maintain traditions, but then some started, you know, embracing more European culture and so forth. But then when people go back home to, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, going to those small towns, the way the culture was practiced when they got off the boat, it's still the culture mm-hmm. that they continue to practice today, and they still practice that hoodoo or juju or vodun and so forth. And that sounds similar to what you're talking about. Is you know, there are a number of people near the port areas in Louisiana, in New Orleans, but the ones who migrated to the country areas or, or stayed there, they maintained the original voodoo that they brought from the continent. And even though people were coming up from Haiti and other places later on, like 100 years later, the original practice is a practice that still exists, and that's the tradition you come from, correct? Yes, 
And see, you also have to realize just because people were brought in doesn't mean that they so readily uh, intermingled all the time. And they didn't necessarily mix those traditions to begin with. Because, like I said, this was maintained within the family. And at a lot of points in history, it was illegal to practice openly. So it was something very secretive. You may not even share with your neighbor that you practice. Right. You, know, you you may not want the entire community now within that household or within that family. And then, you know, you had some people who did work and people just know, okay, that lady does work or go to this man who knows how to heal. But that's not something that you just share with a stranger. Absolutely. And, and that's a that's a very important point. That's a good point because even amongst, um, say, for example, our con people or FA and phone people and so forth, even internecine warfare would keep people from mingling one our con group against the other, even if they were forced over here. Sometimes they would, you know, they would band together to fight against the whites and their offspring, but then they would fall back into their internecine rivalries. And then the same thing with separate ethnic groups. There are stories about, you know, a certain ethnic groups, once they, you know, try to free themselves from enslavement, if there was another rival ethnic group, they would rather turn them over to the so-called slave masters that they just freed themselves from than work together with them because they still had that bad blood because they came from an area where they were at war. And even though, you know, they were forced over here just 10 years before that, this other ethnic group murdered your entire village, and now you are all on the same boat together you're not going to forget that right away. So that whole notion right. of as soon as we got together, we just mingled everything and our traditions just disappeared into a blur. That's not, you know, a hundred percent. But now you brought right. up this notion of, you know, some people still speak, you know, fluent Creole. So this one mm-hmm. thing that's very important that you shared and you touched on in the video and made me aware of that I was totally unaware of is, the proper definition of what Afro-Creole culture is, because people outside of that, you know, territory, the original Louisiana territory, when we hear the term Creole, we just immediately assume it means mixture. And even because Mm -hmm. Europeans use that term, even if they use that term in Sierra Leone or or Liberia, and they say they speak Creole, and they spell it K-R-I-O, and some of the people in Sierra Mm -hmm. Leone will you know, blend their language with English and they say, I speak Creole. So then we automatically assume that the term Creole means, number one, it means mixture. It typically means Mm -hmm. mulatto. It typically means Mm light-skinned person um, blending. Mm -hmm. But when you're talking about Afro-Creole culture, it's totally different from that popular definition. So what is is Afro-Creole culture for real? Okay, so I want to start with say, talking about that spelling. That spelling that you spoke of with the K, and this is this right. the whole spelling thing has kind of become a kind of like a tool of division where people say, okay, this is the real thing and this is something fake or this is something else. So all it is with the K, the difference between the K and the C, Creole with the K, that is how you would spell Creole in Creole. And that's the case in Louisiana, that's the case in Haiti and and some other places as well. Um, Creole was a language that was not originally written down. So whenever they then developed, you know, a system of writing, they would just spell words phonetically. And so when you see even the word uh, voodoo, uh, V-O-D-O-U, and people will say, well, that's the real thing, and the V-O-O-D-O-O, that's that's not the real thing. No, it's just a difference of that's how it's spelled in Creole because it's just spelled phonetically. And Creole, you know, as we spelled it with the with the C R, that's what we would say, you know, being English speakers now. So Creole and its its history in Louisiana um has meant a few things, so that starts the confusion. So at one point, Creole just meant anyone who was born in Louisiana as opposed to somebody who was born in France and came to Louisiana or someone who was born in Africa and came to Louisiana. They were born 
in Louisiana. So you still have a lot of people who are white even who will consider themselves Creole. But the specific Creole that we're speaking of here, which is why I always use Afro-Creole so there's no confusion, I'm speaking of people of African descent who were born in Louisiana and they do have that uh, French influence and probably also French mixture. They may even have Spanish influence or Spanish mixture. When you look at the language, you'll see you'll see evidence of uh, French. You'll see evidence of Spanish, but the construct is African. The way that the words, the sentence structure is African. So looking at the people, most of the time, especially uh, the history in New Orleans, there's a lot of um, kind of uh, bad blood. Uh, when, when it comes to people who consider themselves Creole, because some people here can think back to a time where there was a group of people who were lighter skinned, who considered themselves Creole, and they were trying to uh, separate themselves from being, or to what other people felt like they were trying to separate themselves from the black experience. But this is the deal. Creole is not limited to light skin. It's not limited to dark skin. And the truth is, is that even the people who do not necessarily consider themselves uh, Creole are, in fact, Creole. So those same people who are responsible for the language, the food, the music, uh, the dancing, the voodoo, the culture itself, all of these people are Creole. And that goes from the lightest skin to the darkest skin. So enslaved Africans were also, in fact, Afro-Creole. They may not have been free people of color, but they were still Creole. The free person of color sometimes was Creole. Not always, though, because where people, where Creole people often make the division is they're trying to let you know that they were here before this place became America. So whenever the term African-American became popular, you had a lot of Creoles who didn't want to identify with the term African-American because they want to identify the fact that their family has been here before this place became America. So it's not really a thing now, of separating yourself I, I just from wanna, blackness. To, to make a point Go there, you, when you're talking about before it became America, they're talking about the difference between the whole Louisiana Territory, which was one-third of, you know, what is called the United States now, that was not yeah. America. That was, it was really, you know, basically a colony of France. So it was basically like a, right. French, a French territory. So the rest right. of the United States, or a large portion of the United States was America, and then you had a portion that were, you know, a Spanish colony. But they never considered themselves American. They, they more so considered themselves, quote, unquote, French, so to speak. Yeah. And everybody else, like in, you know, parts of Mississippi, Alabama, you know, Ohio and, you know, Pennsylvania and these other places, like, oh, those are the Americans or the, quote, unquote, North Americans, and they consider themselves like the North French, so to speak. So they couldn't be lumped right. in with, you know, those people that were, like, basically east of the Mississippi River is what you're saying. Right. So you had, for instance, like, let's say we're talking about even free people of color. You had some black American people. They they were American. They came from other places within America, and they came and settled in Louisiana or even settled in New Orleans, but that didn't make them Creole, even if they were free. So at that time, there was a lot of distinctions because there was a, there was a, a shaky time in history where everybody needed to know who were you and what right do you have that was kind of like grandfathered in? So people made a really big deal at that time. And so just through history, a lot of people who have been Creole, they didn't identify with being American because, you know, they hear from their grandparents, okay, when Americans came in, this was bad. You know, this took away our freedom. This took away, you know, what rights we had. This took away our land in some cases. So you have people that strongly disidentify with with the concept of being Creole. Now, even the word Creole was not always used. Even when I think about my my grandparents' generation, um, and you know these are these are people who you know live in rural areas, their country. So they might just call themselves, okay, well I'm a Frenchman. 
they'll say that, but they understand that they are black and they speak a form of French. You know, or even back then they used to call the language neg, short for nigger French. So not everybody even, at the, you know, at, in, at some point in, in history even used the word Creole. But now we're coming into a place where we're trying to really define it and really preserve it because it's a dying language and in some cases it's a, it's a dying tradition, very similar to, you know, what's happened to black culture overall. You know, most of the time that term, uh, our culture, what we contribute, that gets usurped into what people consider to be American culture, and then they drop the black off of it, and it's like, oh, this is American. Rock and roll is American. Jazz is American. And nobody says this is black. So what we're trying to do is say, hey, this is a culture that has been here and is still here, and we want to preserve it. We want to identify it, that it was here, it is here. Absolutely. And it's similar to, like, uh, even on the continent, if you have certain groups that were colonized by the French, certain groups colonized by the, you know, British, even though they're the same ethnic group or related, then they have a different terminology they use, even though, you know, ethnically and racially they're the same. Even in Ivory Coast and Ghana, like 11 Mm -hmm. million Akan people in Ghana, 9 million Akan people in Ivory Coast, some of them call themselves, you know, French Africans, (laughs) and the other ones call themselves British Africans or whatever. They used to say that. But they're the same group, but they were split up. So, and then they approach things slightly different. So they give themselves a different terminology. But when you go right. back to the 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 term with regard to Afro Creole, it's not about this. Before people started associating it with, hey, that means a light skinned person or a mulatto person and so forth. Actually, it just yeah. meant a, a black person who was part of that particular territory who wasn't part of the territory east of the Mississippi. So whether it was black people in the Louisiana Territory, or even in Haiti and other places, all those different areas were simply Afro-Creole culture. And the food is Afro-Creole, dances, religious practice, and so forth, as opposed, almost like um, black people living in Canada, they know they'll call themselves Afro-Canadians, as opposed they wouldn't call themselves African-Americans, even though they're all in North, quote, unquote, America. They know they're in a different culture, so they just call themselves Afro-Canadians. But Afro-Canadian doesn't yeah. mean, oh, if you're Afro-Canadian, you must be light-skinned. It just means every black person who's been there for a long time, they're Afro-Canadian. Everybody who's, you know, been in North America, east of the Mississippi, they were, quote-unquote, African-American. But people west of the Mississippi, they were, quote-unquote, Afro-Creole. So that changes the whole, yeah. you know, definition and perspective. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, you've had this um, this idea kind of perpetuated. And, I mean, even today you have people still in their 60s and 70s today who will tell you, oh, well, Creole, that's those light-skinned people over there, and they don't, you know, like dark-skinned people or whatever. And the thing is, like, any anybody that has been affected by enslavement, you have pockets of people who are affected by self-hate. And so I'm not going to say that there is nobody – you know, because people are conditioned the way they're conditioned. If you had a grandmother who thought a certain way, they raised your mother and father to think that way, and you are raised to think that way. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there are some people who still, when they say that word, they're trying to make a distinction, but that's not the real definition. As a matter of fact, you'll get other Creoles when you see somebody like that and they'll ridicule them for even thinking that, you know, they're somehow something other than black. So that's not the that's not like the the general consensus. But you have some people who have tried to use that and and differentiate themselves or separate themselves, mostly because once the Americans came in, a lot of the freedoms, a lot of the, the things, the land, the privileges were gone. As a free person of color, when the Americans came in you were just black. But just a Negro, so you didn't have any any other privileges. Even though you may have owned some land, or you may have you know held a business, there might have been a business in your family for generations. 
certain rights were taken away at that point. So there Absolutely. was a point where you had some, some groups that were trying to kind of preserve their old way of life. Right. And they distinguish that by the terminology they use. So then you um, – so that that leads to so that making those distinctions are key even for people who know to a certain extent um, some of our people who are living say in who are Gullah speaking people Gullah and Gigi people who are living in North Carolina South Carolina and our their people or Georgia and escaped into Florida and they escaped into Spanish right. Florida so to speak they knew they were able to operate a little bit more freely down there because the Spanish were more so like absentee landlords to a certain extent. So yeah. they were able to operate a little bit more freely, and then they were able to overthrow the Spanish and, you know, start the Gullah Wars and everything else. But it was a difference between operating down there and operating where the, you know, British and later, quote-unquote, Americans were operating. And it's the same thing here. So now when people have a proper definition, that Afro-Creole simply means whether you're jet black or very light, but... That means somebody yeah. is a, a black person who, whose people were shipped over here and they ended up in the Louisiana Territory as opposed to ending up in the territory uh, controlled by the Americans. Um, then yeah. you talked about that diffusion of Afro-Creole culture, so it's not just limited to New Orleans. You talked about the diffusion all the way to the West Coast and all the way even up into New York and other places. So let's talk a little bit about that diffusion of Afro-Creole culture. Okay, well, there were quite a few migrations. And so I know that uh, if you take a look at, you know, probably like the 30s through the 60s, uh, you had a lot of people who went from Louisiana and Texas and they went to the West Coast. Uh, a lot of people, I even have cousins that are on the West Coast, and then, you know, when I get clients, we talk and we, you know, kind of go all the way back to some common uh, last names and common families because most people that are about my age, they've got grandparents that came from Louisiana, you know, and that's the same thing, uh, places like St. Louis, um, you know, the riverboats, travel back and forth from New Orleans to St. Louis, so that coach is very much the same. Everything that's along the Mississippi. Um, you also had people who went to New York. You had a, a, a big migration of people from Louisiana to Chicago as well. So a lot of my clients, and this is, you know, I don't, uh, it's not like I screen people and say, hey, do you have any, any uh, you know, Louisiana ancestry? But it comes up you know, I'll I'll see it in the reading, in, in the divination. And they'll say, Oh yeah, well my uh my grandmother's from Louisiana, my grandfather's from Louisiana or whatever. Um so most black people that I meet, they're they kinda trace their their history back to the South, you know, uh they they probably came from Louisiana or from the, the Carolinas, you know, because they only, if you if you think about that time, there were only three ports in the United States when we think about the beginning, when we think about when we were being brought to this country, and that was New York, there was the Carolinas, and that was New Orleans. So you you only got here one of three ways. Right. That, and that's, that's very important because then that diffusion, people can begin to see that there's a, we're connected more than we really thought we were from, you know, the yeah. south all the way to the west, all the way to the east coast, in the Midwest, all the way up through, you know, up the Mississippi, all the way up to, to Canada, really. So that mm-hmm. kind of pulls everybody in. So um, so we want to talk about the ritual practice. You talked about divination and some of the clients mm-hmm. and so forth, but when people think about, Voodoo in Louisiana, of course, sometimes they'll try to pretend like there's, you know, it's this mixture of pseudo Native Americanism and, you know, white European sympathetic magic and all this other nonsense. But fundamentally, what is voodoo? What is the practice? 
so the practice is African. Um, where some people may get confused is we have always been a people that made a way out of no way. So we will take whatever tools are available. If our herbs that we use in Africa were not available, we're using what's available here. If our divination tools that were not available in Africa, we're going to use what's available here. So really it's about looking at the principles that are applied. You can, you can take anything and incorporate that because we had to at certain points. We had to take anything that was available. But we're talking about the different nations that came in through the slave trade, taking their ancestral traditions and creating pantheons. And with these pantheons, they begin to kind of develop a cohesive language or the way that things were done ritually. So we're talking about honoring the ancestors. We're talking about, you know, honoring uh, the divine forces of nature. We're talking about healing, herbal medicine, divination. And we're also talking about problem solving. So, you know, if there's protection that's needed, there's a way to do that in voodoo. Um, If healing is needed, there's a way to do that. If justice is needed, there's a way to do that. And so basically this had to become a way of life. And the practice of it is emphasized. So even once you had people who over the years they've gotten into Christianity in some way, they still never lost the practice of voodoo. And so they would still use those same African principles even though they may have also went to church. Right. And, in fact, the way you describe it, you talked about the different nations, talked about utilizing things we have here. Of course, we're in a different region of the Earth Mother's body, so we deal with what she produces here under her direction. And Mm -hmm. when we follow her direction, we can utilize these things harmoniously. You talk about the different nations, healing practices, the way we interact with one another, and that's the way you describe it is exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about nation building rooted in ancestral religious practices as the foundation for nation building as opposed to, you know, a secular nationalism, a secular black nationalism or a secular pan-Africanism or some amorphous nationalism with no cultural grounding or somebody talking about culture on the surface, but it has no ancestral religious foundation. So just getting people to see that there's a there's a ancestral religious foundation for the way not only we maintained ourselves but that nation building piece. In fact, even the the revolutions and so forth and resolutions, we were able to utilize ancestral religion as a foundation to free ourselves, but then when we're reestablishing ourselves like you were saying, even the different nations and so forth and the way we interacted, the way we incorporated things into the practice based on our location, that's mm-hmm. all nation building from a holistic, you know, foundation. So we appreciate that definition. And in fact, uh, we want to, actually, it's 1030. <laughs> so we're, we're getting close to <laughs> the end of the broadcast. So we want to take a, there are a couple of um, calls on the phone line. If you have any questions or comments on the phone line, hit the number one. If you have any questions or comments um, in the chat room, you can post those. We're gonna. You want to take a call? We we have a call on the phone line. Okay, Michelle on the phone line number zero two one seven. You had a question or a comment? Uh yes, yeah. Hessa Brother Crazy and uh, yes, Mr. Kalindan. Um, my question relates to the uh, ritual practices of the um, of the African slaves. Um, specifically, um, I read about um, Kofi, who was an um, an Akan slave that started a, a slave rebellion in 1763 in British Guyana. Upon his death, his men sacrificed two of the um, 
the white soldiers that were fighting against him over his, they sacrificed the soldiers over his grave. What is the purpose of that practice and the purpose of um, blood sacrifice in general? I mean, as it relates okay, so to... Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, so um, So it's a couple of things. Now, I'm, I'm familiar to a certain extent with the revolt in Guyana. Um, right. I don't know a full story of exactly what they did with regard to the ritual process. You know, there are different reports that come out. Mm-hmm. You have to check the sources to see. But um, fundamentally, on one hand, when you talk about sacrifice like that, now, when you talk about uh, execution of an enemy, you know, that's okay. always a good thing. So sometimes um, reporters or people who are reporting on an incident, they'll say, you know, they did a uh, human sacrifice, and it was more so a capital punishment. And, of course, you know, anything that we engage in, that's, you know, we incorporate ancestral religious practice in relation to it, but it wouldn't be a, a notion of we're offering the spirit of one of the whites in our offspring to a deity because, of course, that we don't do that because mm-hmm. a deity is well, their spirit like is repulsive. Because I'm like, why would they, you know, you know like a white soldier? <laughs> Right. More so, most likely the way it was reported, they were reported as though it was a human sacrifice to the deity. But when the spirit of one of the whites in their offspring separates from the body, no deity is accepting their spirit. That's, that's not happening. So whoever was reporting that, they'll often say that. Um, but this is a, you know, a summary execution. This is capital punishment. This is somebody, and we're showing the enemy that you come against us, we're going to cut your head off and your body is discarded, of course, unceremoniously, and the spirit um, of the deceased cracker will be suffering in the spirit realm, earthbound, and so forth as well. We'll make sure that continues, you know, perpetually for them in the spirit realm. So we're not, their spirits have nothing to do. We're not working with their spirits afterwards. Sometimes you have individuals talking about they go to graves of the whites and their offspring and get those spirits to work with them. That's nonsense. That's insane. That's when you know you're practicing a perversion of a real tradition. We only work with those spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors of our blood circle who are assigned to us pre-incarnation from our specific clans to assist us in our development. And of course we work with the Abosom, the Vodou, who are connected to us, who are assigned to us pre-incarnation as well and connected to our matric clans and patric clans specifically for our you know, assisting us in our functioning creation. So anything dealing with the enemy, that's a summary execution, it's capital punishment, and it's sending a message. First of all, it's getting the enemy away. It's just like cutting a tumor off from your body or, you know, some viral agent, bacteria and so forth. First you kill it, you remove it from the body, you dispose of it, and then you let the others know this is what's going to happen if you come against us. So it's a repulsive kind of thing. Um, but animal sacrifice in general um, is, is no different than, uh, for example, in ancient Kemet, you'll find that blood wasn't even allowed on the shrines. So there's a different approach. And sometimes people see the different animals. Sometimes they will raise these animals to a certain, you know, um, age and so forth. And when the animal makes their transition, then they mummify the body of the animal they communicate with the spirit that's an animal totem and so forth. And they use the body, um, you know, ritually. Just It's no different mm-hmm. than, for example, incense. If you have okay. a stick of incense sitting there, it's just sitting there. When you put fire to the incense, then it releases its essence. If okay. you put fire to the flesh of an animal, just like cooking, you know what I'm saying, it releases the aroma, but releases also some an energy aspect of the energy complex. When an animal is killed, just like a, you know, um, <laughs> when a person's killed, but when, when that happens, when the life force separates from the body, there's an explosion of energy. Now, sometimes people are in, engaged in animal sacrifice and they're, they're just doing a bunch of nonsense. They're just killing animals, trying to release that quick release of energy, no different than someone hitting a crack pipe and, you know, there's a explosion of energy for a second. It lasts for about five minutes, and then they're on to the next high. 
But some people are killing animals to release that energy to feed a discarnate spirit that's wayward and uncultivated, to feed them a little energy just like feeding a crackhead and so forth. They get a little energy off of that, mm-hmm. and they'll do something for you. And then they want you to continue to do sacrifices and so forth. But so a lot of that is happening, and people are associating that with that's the foundation of the tradition. Sacrifice does okay. happen, but sometimes what people don't understand is when an animal sacrifices itself. Just like we would step in harm's way to defend one of our children, mm-hmm. even if we knew something was going to happen to us, certain animal spirits, they will step forward so their body, their spirit can be released from the body. They go back to the spirit realm and so forth, and we utilize that release for and direct that energy release to, you know, um, fulfill a deficit in some area of life. So that notion of the animal stepping forward to sacrifice itself, that's a totally different concept that most people are unaware of. But we, we did do, if you look at, there's a broadcast, Boa, that we did yeah. talking about the yeah. nature of yeah. sacrifice. But see, I didn't understand this one because this involves human sacrifice, and then um, the filmmaker, the most recent um, film about um, Kofi um, was done, I think, in 2014, and the filmmaker, Amanda Wilson, said that um, his grave, actually, um, no one knows where he's buried. It's a secret. So um, some of the other slave heroes, like Damon, um, they're like little markers that still remain today. But um, his just has never been found, but um, even though it hasn't, um, there is like a big, like 30-foot monument in the center of the country that, you know, um, I mean, this, the, the monument, I mean, initially it was like kind of like not accepted because it's not like a true likeness. It's kind of like, um, like you know, an abstract representation, and of course, people were looking at it with kind of like European eyes. Oh, the lips are too big. Oh, it's too <laughs> that kind of thing. We to it in that way, but I think you know, over oh, okay. time, people have become more accepting of it. Okay. But, but you know, like I said, okay. I was so we... just confused about the purpose of you know using a human and than uh, an enemy to that, you know? Absolutely. I no, I, I understand what you're saying. In fact, you know, check out that, um, the Afori Boa piece, and then we also did one on Kanun and the nature of sacrifice, because we were talking about this notion of um, what they would call retainer sacrifices. They saw some groups on the continent, you know, killing people when a, when a king or a queen died and so forth, and... Um, some people were wondering what that was about. And, of course, that's really not part of the culture. And we talk about how that came into being um, and why it's not really part of the culture and why people go rogue sometimes when they're, you know, get into power and so forth. So we go into some detail about that um, in those two broadcasts. Okay. Well, thanks for answering my question. Okay. We appreciate the call. Merasa. So, Kalinda, you want to talk a little bit about the just that the notion of sacrifice in the mm-hmm. Vodou tradition? Yeah, so um, sacrifice and offerings are given to spirit basically to create a line of communication and also to give energy. Uh, if you think about where we are, where we're – we're dense. The energy is dense. And then if you think about spirit, they vibrate at a higher frequency. And so there has to be a meeting point. There has to be uh, communication. And so we would offer food, drink. There's sometimes animal sacrifices. And that creates that energetic connection to where they can communicate with us, we can communicate with them, and there can be a transfer of energy. So, you know, when you deal with uh, different spirits, 
you know, certain spirits have particular foods that they like. They have particular colors. Uh, there's particular things that you would place on their altars. Um, they even have certain ceremonial dances. They have certain songs. And so when it comes to the sacrifices, this all fits in the same thing. We're trying to build that bridge and make that connection, make that communication. Absolutely. And that's key because it's all, like you said, it's catalog, catalog basically. So the way a certain divinity, some divinities movements or dance movements are more fast and fiery and spinning and so forth. The some are mm-hmm. more cool and watery and fluid. And then when you look at the foods right. that they are connected to them and, you know, the certain kind of animals and their energy complex and the mineral life, it's all within that same energy complex. So it allows us to get into that frequency when we, mm-hmm. you know, provoke the energy of those different uh, aspects in that catalog, then we can get on the same wave and then we can commu- communicate with a greater, with greater clarity. So, right. um, but some people want to, you know, associate entire tradition, which very often happens in the way people are practicing traditions. They're learning certain things from other individuals where every time they get a reading, everything is about a sacrifice. You need a goat, you need a chicken, you need a ram, you need this, and people just spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars, you know, to some inexperienced priest or priestess from another tradition because they don't know what their own tradition is. It goes back to that blood circle piece. We have to realize that, you know, the spirits that we're communicating with, this is a part of us. Is a part of, of, of who we are, you know, your body, your spirit, your emotions. This is a part of who we are. So you don't, you don't need to sacrifice an animal for everything. You don't need to pay someone to communicate with the spirits, <laughs> you know, um, it's it's nothing wrong, I think, with, with getting training from someone, but we don't want to make this a situation where you think you're totally handicapped without something or someone else. If you sit down in the quiet and you close your eyes, you can connect with your ancestors. You can connect with the divine forces of nature. That's 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 who you are. That's a part of you. So it's uh, there are certainly times where sacrifice is necessary, you know, or uh, where it's preferable. But that shouldn't be for everything, <laughs> you know. It shouldn't be. You 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 don't don't feel the need to go out and you know, have somebody else be your only source of communicating with divinity that's already a part of you. Absolutely. And in fact, talking about Vodou and that that whole notion of um, not being dependent or the, the central focus of the tradition. So what is the term, what is the term for the, the spirit governing the head in Louisiana Vodou? Uh Metet. And Metet it just means the master of the head. So that okay. spirit is is basically like saying your you know, uh it lets you know your soul's purpose. It lets you know or what uh your but they would say the ori. So this is right. the Metet. And so we are you know, we always refer to what spirit is in your head, who's in your head. And that's what we mean by that. So once you find out who your governing governing spirit is, then you know your purpose. You know what you're here to do. You know your taboos. You know what you should be doing. You know what you shouldn't be doing. You know, um, you basically begin to understand yourself. So that's uh, the important. And then what what is the relationship? with the ancestresses and ancestors with regard to that that process? 
uh, well, the first thing you want to connect with your with your ancestors because you 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 can't you can't jump over them and go back to something you know that is further in history or further reach. So your ancestors they are, are also a part of you. That's that's your DNA. That's your blood. And also, they're the ones who are going to be much more concerned about your human experience, your your needs, you know, um, what's happening in the family. So you, any, any tradition that is not emphasizing ancestors uh, is kind of defeating the purpose of, of what we're doing here because you can't, go back to your divinity without also discussing how did you come into the world? Your mother and father, that was the first divinity that you understood. And then you understood your grandparents. And then as we get more into the, to the tradition, you begin to communicate with ancestors that you didn't meet. You know, they may have already passed before you you were born. And then that's how you go. You go back in time, you go back into Africa. You don't skip over that. You don't skip over the experiences of the ancestors here and just go immediately back to Africa. You you can't overlook, you know, even if we were talking in, in general human terms, you wouldn't walk into a room and walk past your mother or walk past your grandmother and go and greet somebody else. That doesn't fly in black culture. You were supposed to greet the elders first. And so that's exactly what we're doing when we're practicing. Why would you begin anything and you have a mother, a father, a grandmother, grandfather, or even if we're talking about several, several generations ago, why would you overlook them and they're also of spirit to try to go back to something that, is a little bit, um, I'm not going to say further from you, but that you may not be as familiar with immediately. I'm going to trust my mother before I trust anybody. I'm going to trust my grandmother and my grandfather before I trust anybody. So there's, there's a lot that can happen in the spirit realm, just like there's a lot that can happen in the physical realm. And so I rely on the knowledge that my parents and my grandparents raised me with to interact in the physical world. You know, as a child, you know, you know what to eat, what not to eat. You know how to cross the street. You know how to not get in danger. So that's the same thing in the spirit realm. Why would you want to interact without not only acknowledging and honoring those ancestors, but also those ancestors have your best interest in mind? And you, you you can trust those ancestors because any situation I've ever been in, and I've been in other ritual settings that were not just the settings that I I came from. I've I've been in ritual settings with people from different parts of the world, and my ancestors let me know when something wasn't right. They let me know when to leave. They let me know where not to go back to. And they also let me know when something was safe, it was okay for me to participate in. Sometimes they put me in situations just so I could observe it, I could see it, and I could know it from firsthand experience. But your ancestors are always going to be that sounding board to let you know what's right for you, what's not right for you, what is dangerous, what is safe. So... I would say before thinking about anything else, contact your ancestors because they are going to feel very familiar to you. And you don't always need to think about the humanity of them, who they were when they were here. A lot of things lift when they they transition. So a lot of the heaviness, the density, um, even some of the melodity, even if we're talking about uh, mental and emotional imbalances, that that shift, that transmute as they make their journey. And sometimes you have situations where um, a certain ancestor, a certain may, may be having a problem with that, and they 
you know, we can we can assist them ritually. But for the most part, you're now dealing with somebody who is not heavily affected by whatever emotional or mental turmoil that they may have suffered with from here. If they've, you know, if they've been able to, to make their transition in the proper way. Oh, that, that's that's a very important point. Um, well, all of the points important. Just to focus on the ancestresses and ancestors. Some of them, um, like we would say, like the ones who are closest to us, who were here for the past two, three hundred years, they may mm-hmm. know how to. They learn how to utilize, for example, echinacea or something where ancestresses and ancestors from four hundred years ago who never lived here, they don't know how to utilize that, so they can't teach you how to pick it and use it for an illness. They just can't right. because they never saw the plant before. So you don't leapfrog your own, the most recent, to go to the ones who can't show you that it didn't learn how to navigate their way through life here. Yeah, so that's, mm-hmm. which is key to one of the reasons for people who don't know, the reason that me and Kalinda connected um, instantly because we connected. In fact, it was first dealing with the first Etchy Sign Conference, and she contacted me because she wanted to, uh, she was talking about vending, but as soon as we talked just for a few minutes, I knew right away this is my peer or my elderess. Uh, so <laughs> I was like, hey, can you, <laughs> can you please speak at this event? <laughs> so because we were on the same page. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, when you think about, um, can you hear me okay? Hello. Okay, we uh the call dropped for some reason. Um so for those who are in the chat room, and I, it looks like because my call dropped, it looked like Kalinda's call dropped as well. So if you can, um, if you're in the chat room, if if you can hear, if we're back on, let us know in the chat room. Just uh, hit the notification. If you're on the phone line, let me see if I can bring Kalinda back on. Okay, Michiro, can you hear me? Something happened. Okay. okay, yeah, so the call dropped, and once my call dropped, then your call dropped. But, no, I was just yeah. saying that we, we connected. We were on the same frequency in this whole notion of etchy sign and such religious reversion and dealing with our spirit genetic inheritance, the way we preserved our ancestral traditions here. For the past 300 years, we were on the same page, so we've been connected ever since like that. Um, and this whole, you know, notion of dealing with our spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors who maintained the culture in our blood circles for centuries and transmitted that to us, and that is the actual ancestral religion that we must practice because it's, it's in our blood circle. We can't leapfrog that just to just imitate the contemporary expression of ancestral religion found in Ghana, Nigeria, Benin, Togo, and so forth. When we left the continent a few hundred years ago, the way we practiced then, as we always say, was time stamped in our bones and blood, fossilized within us, and that's the tradition we passed on. And whatever happened over the past 300 years since we left, that's what happened with them. So that expression is what they practice now. We practice the expression that we brought over here, and then we interface with this region of the Earth Mother's body and forged a locative identity, and now we have a culture. But also that that point about, especially people who maybe they had a, a mental or behavioral illness because of a traumatic brain injury or some kind of chemical imbalance and so forth, and then you talked about how once they transition, it's no longer dense because mm-hmm. they're no longer in that body that was, you know, that was, um, you know, affected in that sense. So they don't have to operate through that physical vessel that was hampered by that uh, injury or that kind of, you know, disorder. 
So they're still no, they're no longer controlled by that. Specifically, if that was what was going on. Now, of course, we have some people who are dealing with the negative, you know, discarnate, disembodied spirits, and that's the result of their right. you know, their behavioral illness as a result of that. And so they're still operating crazy like that in the spirit realm. They're just not in the physical body. But the ones who were normal people, but they had some kind of chemical imbalance or some kind of physiological problem or some combination thereof. Yes, once they transition, mm-hmm. that's a very important point for people to know because they can, you know, they can still work on our behalf because they're no longer, you know, held down, um, so to speak. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that that just opens that whole notion of, you know, we did that broadcast therapist versus the rapist ancestry religion versus psychology because, mm-hmm. you know, very often these therapists, they 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 can't really solve the problems of the person because they can't communicate with the ancestresses and ancestors or this kind of spirits that are unrelated that are affecting the individual. Okay, so we have a yeah. just a couple of more calls. Um, and actually, it's 11 o'clock, so we have to wrap it up. So um, on the phone line, number 1372, you had a question or a comment? Uh, uh, number one three seven two. Get up. Yeah, we we can hear you. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Okay, okay. How you doing? This is Ben Hassan. Uh, Good question. Um, hit up, bro. Um. The way with spirits you were uh, uh, talking about earlier, uh, when you invoke a, a spirit to a task, uh, whether it be uh, orderly or disorderly, can that same spirit be invoked from a task that's the opposite can 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 a, can a spirit be invoked to to do a disorderly task and an orderly task? So I just want to make sure with the question you're asking. Um, if you, you're talking about like an ancestral spirit or even a spirit that's not related to the person. Can they be uh, ritually evoked for an orderly task as well as a disorderly task? Whether it was at the same time or at different times? Is that what you're asking? At different times, absolutely. Okay. So, and number one, yes, and people do that on a regular basis, and this is where some of the issues come in, <laughs> right? Because some people are, you know, evoking ancestral spirits and referring to them as Arisha and Vodou and all of that, and then when they do something crazy, they say, well, we can't put our human judgment on the Vodou because they're deities and they're not like us and we can't put our morality on them. And it's, you know, just nonsense. So depending on the character of the spirit, they're no different than they were when they were alive. Some people, you know, you have cousins or uncles and so forth and certain things they do that are good, normal, and certain things you could pay them to do which are criminal. And if they make their transition, they still have that mindset where they're not grounded in, you know, a strong moral foundation, some things they would do that are criminal and some things they would do that are, you know, helpful. And some of them will take, like we said earlier, sacrifice to do certain things, whether they're moral or immoral. But, Kalinda, what what would your comment be on that from the Vodou perspective? I would say, first of all, we have to think about what we consider to be in order and out of order or what we consider to be moral or immoral. Um, Mm -hmm. Just because it's not all flowers and sunshine doesn't necessarily mean it's out of order. For instance, if someone were to harm a child in my family, I would not consider that to be out of order to take care of them the way that I need Mm -hmm. to. And my ancestors would not consider that to be out of order to do what needs to be done to bring justice to that situation or to protect the child. 
So we have to think about, you know, there's just, it's a very uh, Christian notion to think, about, you know, um, you know, this is bad, this is good. Uh, we know when we're going against what's right because we get the, we get that feeling. You know what? As a matter of fact, we know when we're betraying ourselves. And sometimes mm-hmm. that might even be what uh, most people might not even consider it to be an immoral thing. But you know when you're going against yourself, you're going against your spirit, you're going against uh, even the dignity of your family. So I think the first thing would be to just decide what exactly we're talking about with out of order and in order and moral and, you know, immoral and everything. Um, because it may, it may not really that may not even really be the case. You know, we may not even be talking about something that is, is bad as it would be defined within the context of the spirituality. Mm-hmm. And, you know, things that if, if we're talking about just doing something out of greed or out of ego and, you know, hurting people, hurting ourselves, that's one thing. But just the notion of doing something that, you know, maybe in regular circumstances you would see that as somewhat harmful. It doesn't mean that that's harmful in every situation. So I would really say let that let that sit on your heart, whatever that is, and, and you will know because you will feel a, a feeling. You know, I know when, when something's about to happen that I see and I feel is wrong, I get a, a funny feeling in my stomach. I get a funny feeling in my chest. I know it's wrong. I know that that this should not happen. And it might not even be something that I'm doing. It might be something that I'm witnessing. You know, you see uh, somebody being, you know, for instance, you go in the school system and you see a black child being handled a certain way by white people. You know it's wrong. You feel it. So mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of de- 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 depends on what, are, what exactly are we talking about. You know, what is the motive here? What is the, the purpose? That really is going to determine whether we're talking about something that's in or out of order. Right. Um, do, I mean, do you have, a, like, a specific uh, thing that you're, you're thinking of that you want to share? To, so yeah, that you I'll, can, I'll have, uh, just, just a real over, oversimplified, real simple a uh, uh, real simple example. We uh, say say a, a, a girlfriend wants to do something to a boyfriend because she caught him. Okay. Because she's what that, you say? Because she caught him cheating on her. She, she caught him with okay. another girl. All right, and uh, okay, she wants to punish, she, she wants to punish him in some way for that, and mm-hmm. she goes to. Uh, as a practitioner, or, 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 or and has and has some has something, some entity is called upon to do something to him, to do some harm to him for that. And I I call that a, that that that'll be a selfish thing to do, right there. To me. Now, could so ultimately that same entity that was called for to do that harm to that gentleman for that for that help with those practices. Could it be called for to do something beneficial for someone else? Okay, so this is this is what you have going on here. This what we're talking about now is not in fact it doesn't really have much to do with spirituality, even though people categorize that. We're right. talking about humanity here. We're talking about a humane experience. So the dynamic between man and woman, the whole cheating and revenge thing, that's really something that you know, it should be able to be handled between that man and woman. And the, the the concept of revenge, and let me do something to him because he cheated on me, this is really mm-hmm. just out of a hurt ego. And right. when you have people that will go to somebody else because they're hurting, that person will take advantage of them and say, okay, I can do this for you. I can put right. something on him right. and we can use this spirit. But they're not necessarily using real authentic divine forces of right. nature. These are not real Buddha, these are not real Orisha. These are just um disincarnate spirits, sometimes disincarnate family members. Somebody that they've been working with or calling on, they may even use consider them to be certain cemetery spirits. Now just right. because they're using these names 
just because they say, okay, I went to the crossroads and I did this, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're contacting the right. authentic sources. Right. So uh, it's a, it's a, it's kind of hard to really talk about certain things because there's so much going on under the guise of African spirituality that doesn't really have right. much to do with uh, the true nature of it itself. Absolutely. So the thing is, like, with a situation like that, that's what 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 the sister really, what it would benefit her more to go to somebody to find a certain amount of healing. She wants to get revenge because she's in pain. So right. what I do when people come to me, I try to focus their attention away from the other person because when people come, they're hurting, and they always want to do something to the other person. Well, I want to get my husband to do this. I want to get my wife to do this. I want to make somebody act this way. No. Mm-hmm. What about you? Let's put that, that into you, and let's see what you need. What do you need right now? You need assistance. You need some understanding. You need healing. You need to have some of those heavy energy blocks removed. So it would benefit her to have that done, but most of the time you're dealing with somebody who does not know the tradition as well as they, they think they do or as well as they're trying right. to convince people. And they're really doing something because, you know, most of the time, even when I talk to people and I say, well, I'm not going to help you get revenge, but I will help you heal. I will help you restore balance and alignment. That is so not attractive to them at that moment. They are not really wanting to uh, deal with that. They want what they want, and they're willing to pay for whatever it was they want. They're not trying to hear you talking about the healing at that moment. So it's easier for somebody to come in and say, okay, I'm going to help you. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do something to your ex boyfriend to make sure he knows, you know, he should have never crossed you. But that's mm-hmm. that's that's not that's not maturity. That's right. not and, and you should be mature if you're doing uh spirit work for other people, but that's not maturity, that's a bruised and hurt ego and you have somebody else who is taking advantage of that pain. Thank you. That clarified that for me. <laughs> Oh, you're welcome. Okay, Medalsi, we appreciate that call. Yeah, Medalsi, bro. Uh, so uh, I really appreciate that answer because that's, um, well, as you know, <laughs> those kind of things, you get those kind of requests on a regular basis. And so the people recognize, you know, where you're at you know, mm-hmm. morally and mature-wise, and mm-hmm. then they won't necessarily approach you with that. But I do want people to, right. speaking of that, uh, your website is www.ladylaveau.com. Um, yeah. We have that link on the on the webpage as well, so you can contact Kalinda for divination and so forth. Um, we have, okay, so we have... One more phone call, and we only have a few minutes left in the broadcast, actually, so we're going to take this one last phone call. Hold on one second. Um, hold on one second. We're just it's taking a minute to... It looks like the console is having an issue. Okay, so it looks like the studio console and blog talk is having an issue bringing the call on. It's just um, constantly buffering. So, um, well, just if you have a question or a comment for Kalinda, of course, she's on Facebook. It's Kalinda Laveau. Of course, the website is there. Um, you can send those questions there as well. Um, and, of course, we want to invite the Afrikani, Afrikani community um, to the Ka, Ka'et, Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo Training, Cultural and Ritual Retreat. We'll be dealing with Oberima, Afrikani manhood, Obatine, Afrikani womanhood, rooted in our ancestral religious values. The event, the retreat, is in Treme in New Orleans, Memorial Day weekend. And if you could talk about a little bit about the difference between 
you know, the tour that you conduct. So we're going to have our workshops. We're going to have vegan meals and so forth. We're going to have ancestral ritual. Um, but also the tour that you do that's rooted in a, a proper, you know, view and, you know, tour of New Orleans. What, what's, what's the difference between what you do and, you know, what other people are doing? And, by the way, even before, you know, that weekend, you do these tours just generally. So it's not just that weekend. This is yeah. part of what you do on a regular basis. So people need to know if they do visit New Orleans, they can contact you for a specialized tour. But what, what, what is that like? Okay, so what's typically done here, you know, the tourist industry is a very big industry. So there are lots of different tours that basically play on the romance of the uh, kind of the the fabrication of these ideas. And so, you know, because of this concept of voodoo, they kind of link every scary movie topic in with that. And they'll say, oh, voodoo, ghosts, vampires, mystery, you know. Um, and they'll give you mostly these stories that they created. They'll tell you about a haunted building and whatever story or some experience with, you know, some person who was supposed to be a ghost or whatever. And they'll give you a lot of that, and they'll kind of mix that in with the history of New Orleans. But most of it is just kind of folklore that uh, was either written by tour guides from long ago or it was something that was an actual kind of like local uh, folklore, local legend that has been manipulated. So that's pretty much what the tours are like here. I walk by them all the time. Uh, I cringe at them because they're really silly. They're giving out a lot of bad information. And, frankly, I find them boring. Um, What I do is I want – every black person who comes to New Orleans to understand that the bourbon street that you see in your face and, you know, the Mardi Gras beads and show me something, mister, I want you to understand that that's not the culture here. That's not the real culture here. And this place is just as important. You know, a lot of people are accustomed to understanding that they want to make a pilgrimage back to Africa or they want to go to Brazil, or they want to go and find themselves in Cuba or or wherever, but we're overlooking our sacred places right here, and one of these places is is New Orleans, and it's kind of like the truth is hidden in plain sight, so we have all of this stuff that says voodoo, voodoo, voodoo here, voodoo barbecue, voodoo drink, voodoo beer, voodoo football or basketball or whatever it is. Um, it's hidden in plain sight, so it kind of almost it it uh, it lessens what what is actually here. It uh, it diminishes it by giving you this touristy idea of something that most people can see is not rooted in any type of truth. But then it makes people think, because I've heard several people say, oh, "I've been to New Orleans. There's nothing there. There are no black people practicing voodoo there." No, there's nothing on Bourbon Street. Or no, there's nothing that you were able to find maybe that first weekend that you got here. But what I want to do or what I'm doing, I want to provide an inroad to the already existing culture here and also the history that is relevant to black people everywhere. Recently I've been getting a lot of, uh, black people from uh, other countries. I had a couple the other day, they were from France. And, you know, they trace their their families back to uh, different parts of the Caribbean. But they were very interested to find out what happened here. And then they were amazed at the likeness of some of the words that I used that they could remember from back home with their grandmothers. Uh, the concepts and how similar they were to what they already knew. So I want to be available to clarify, you know, what's been uh, the history and the concepts that have been painted, show you what's here, show you the the actual places, show you the actual people, 
show you the uh, the keys, the signs and symbols that have been left behind by our ancestors so that today we will know who we are. You can see that here. And I also want to provide an authentic ritual experience, especially to those who are in search of what their ancestors have done and they don't have any other exposure to it. They have no no way into it. I I want my tour to be that way into it. And what usually happens, usually I'll get a couple or I'll get a group of people who come on a tour, and then afterwards they're interested in the tradition. They want to have uh, divination done, or they want to find out more information about the tradition. They never really just stop at the tour process, even if it's about referring them to some information and not even providing a service, they still want to go further with it. And so that's what, why I do this. I figure most people, most locals here will resent the tourist industry, and it's understandable because it's a lot of exploitation of black culture here. But what I'm doing is I want to utilize this already open space to connect people with this real culture, this real history, this real tradition here. And we don't really need to lie about it. We don't need to make it up. We don't need to fabricate uh, these outlandish stories because I think that what's here is already interesting enough. And I think that people who come to search for it, they're more than grateful to find out something that is a key to who they are. Absolutely. And I, that's, that's um, not only one of the highlights of the retreat, the upcoming retreat, but like we said, this is something that's ongoing. It's needed. People, you know, whenever you're traveling, and just changing the, this whole notion of what are our sacred spaces for, quote, unquote, pilgrimage here in the United States. We're showing that the seats of voodoo and the seats of hoodoo and the seats of juju and the seats of Gullah Geechee culture and so forth, these are the sacred ancestral spaces that our people need to be making pilgrimages to, going to South Carolina, going to places in Chicago, going to places in New Orleans, going to places in Mississippi, Alabama, where these ancestral traditions were maintained, and this is part of that process. So people need to drink that in. So we have um, – well, actually, we're going to get the broadcast here. We only have a couple of minutes left. So, of course, I'm going to say, may I say, yet I say we thank you for – you know, coming on, honoring us with your presence. As people can see, Linda's a true historian. She's a healeress, a diviner, an educator, a vegan chef, an artist, a musician, which many people don't know. So you just <laughs> stun it all over the show. I think you're the original number one stunner from New Orleans. So. Forget about these other people. You just stun it all over the nation right now. So um, if you all want to hear from <laughs> no, but seriously, we, if you want to come out, connect with us at this retreat, we have a few spaces left. We started out with 25 spaces. We have a few spaces left. We only have about, what, six weeks um, until five, about six weeks left before the event. So Memorial Day weekend, New Orleans, Treme. So look on the website, reserve your space today. Once um, spaces are full, then we're going to close registration. It's limited space for two reasons. Number one, um, just like we had the event in South Carolina, we had about, about 25 spaces, the smaller group. So the workshops, the trainings, much more involved. You know, if you have 100 people, you can only get to a certain number of questions. So when you have about 20 to 25 people, everybody's questions that can be, you know, investigated in, in depth. We can go in depth on, you know, 
on the workshops, Obatine, Obedi Ma, as well as Patas Asatim, as well as the tour and so forth, and the ritual piece. So a smaller group is more ideal. So once the registration is full, we may be able to complete registration and close registration within the next day or two because we only have a few spaces left. So if you would like to attend the event, go to the Ka Kaet page, Soul of Hoodoo and Voodoo page on our website. We just released the trailer last night to give you some more detailed information about the conference or retreat. So you can check that out. We just posted it. We, we, we finished it last night. We posted it this morning. So some people may have not realized that we posted it earlier this morning. So you can check that out to get some more information. But, again, Kalinda Yerase, we thank you for coming on the show. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. I, I wanted to just mention um, with the retreat uh, something that uh, we're going to, you know, that you'll be able to experience. You'll be able to experience uh, ritual songs, ritual dances. Um, you'll be able to experience uh, the masking tradition that is here in New Orleans. Um, you'll be able to see uh, certain artwork that is specific to this tradition, um, as well as actually being on the sacred lands. And so, um, you know, I think it's um, for those who, who haven't been able to experience that, this is uh, it's a good opportunity to just kind of be immersed in the culture, you know, at once, and then also to do it in this context, along with other people who are interested in doing the same thing. Yes, absolutely. And I, I'm looking forward myself to reconnecting um, in New Orleans. And, you know, the people who have signed up, they're very excited about it. So we, we know it's going to be a very educational experience, ritual experience, spiritual experience, and so forth. So... We're really looking forward to it. So if you want to get on, everyone, go to the page and sign up, and you'll see all of the information is on the Kaakaya page. If you have any questions, of course, send us an email via Facebook or um, our, our regular, you know, connects on social media. So, again, yet I'll say everyone for tuning into the broadcast. Um, we appreciate your support. Go to the site. And Yebeshi Abio, we will meet again. Hit up. Yeah.